premise of this presentation is based on two assumptions. The first assumption is that skills development is not enough in itself to constitute any meaningful economic development. And so skills development has to be combined with enterprise development options. The presentation outline looks at the Niger Delta women's profile. Is that the beginning? Okay. And then the Niger Delta youth profile, and this includes female and male youth. And then the Niger Delta economy, as well as the role of women and youth, male and female youth, I always like to emphasize that. And then global and Nigerian models of entrepreneurship successes. After that, we look at the key historical and structural factors which undermine the equitable participation of women as well as male and female youth in economic development processes. And then explore some economic opportunities that government has put in place as well as development interventions. And then that will bring us to the point of looking at some recommendations for the way forward in the next four years. So first, women's profile. We've tried to highlight some of the statistics from the National Population Commission website. And this is based on the 2006 census. I know that uh, when Simon was making his presentation, he made reference to the fact that the Nigerian <laughs> population census figures could be misleading, but for the purpose of reference, we are using the 2006 population census. And we know also from the population census of 2006 that women constitute 49.19% of the total Nigerian population. And similarly, within the Niger Delta region, women also constitute about 50% of the entire population of the Niger Delta. And then we go on to look at the statistics for youth. The National Youth Policy, first of all, defines youth in Nigeria as those between the ages of 18 and 35. So for our discussion this afternoon, we'll be looking at youth from the perspective of that age range. And I saw an interesting study that was commissioned by PIND, an assessment on youth in the Niger Delta region. And this was carried out in the year 2011. And it lays out very interesting statistics about youth in the Niger Delta. One, that youth constitute 30%. That is, youth under the ages of 30 years constitute over 60% of the Nigerian population. And 69% of university and polytechnic graduates in Nigeria are, not, are, are unemployed. And that employers in Nigeria consider graduates as not having employable skills. And so even where the opportunity were to be there for employers to want to employ, they will be looking for youth who have skills, which Nigerian youth graduates happen not to have. That's one of the realities that came out of that report. The next thing that that report points to is that the Niger Delta youth hold the government and oil companies that operate within the region as being responsible for their unemployment status and for all the problems that happen in the Niger Delta. And so in their own bid to respond to that predicament, two re reactions are seen. We have a group of youth in the Niger Delta who tend to engage in constructive activism, you know, through civil society engagement. But we also have another category of youth who tend to resort to militancy and kidnapping because they have to find a way of venting their frustrations. And these two reactions have actually built up over the years to the point where, of course, we all know about the amnesty program, which is helping to, to reclaim the peace that is so desirable in the Niger Delta region. And therefore, we have come to the point where the youth in the Niger Delta need to be engaged constructively by either the civil society organizations or the government or the oil uh, companies themselves or the organized private sector 
which is part of the reason why these kinds of discussions are being initiated, to see how can the different stakeholder groups that have a stake in the Niger Delta come together to discuss in the most constructive ways of engaging youth in the Niger Delta. And so this is one of the reasons why we are trying to look at some of these issues and to engage in that conversation or to begin that conversation as to what ways the issues of the Niger Delta youth in particular can be best resolved. And I also try to highlight some uh, models of successes that we see globally and also within the Nigerian context because we realize that some of the people who have also made iconic landmarks globally, like the co-founder of Facebook, are people who did it or who became successes within the age bracket that we are looking at, 18 to 30, 35. And we also identify that even though we do identify some structural challenges or barriers that impede the progress of women as well as male and female youth in the Niger Delta region, there are also women who have been able to break barriers in the context that they found themselves to the extent that they have become iconic in the businesses that they are doing. And we see that all these women happen to have combined both skills and entrepreneurship drive. One such example is Oprah Winfrey, now looking at it globally. But when you come down to Nigeria, we also have iconic women within the Nigerian context. And in fact, the current richest woman in Nigeria, Fulano Sho Alakija, started as a fashion designer before she got into the business of oil and gas. So some of these initiatives that are being introduced are skills development or capacity building opportunities that could be undermined or considered to be, you know, at the level of micro, are actually initiatives that also build up over time to become very huge. And so when you look at micro, small, and medium enterprise development schemes of development initiatives, those are some of the starting points or building blocks that one has to look at. I identify some of the historical structures that impede <coughs> the progress of Nigerian women as well as male and female youth within the Niger Delta. And some of those are the gender discriminatory practices that occur within our culture as a result of the patriarchal system that is in place. And some of these structures, systemic structures include lack of access and control to means of production like land, for instance, because we find that for you to effectively participate in entrepreneurship development, there are times where you need to access finance. And the commercial banking system within Nigeria will normally require you to have a collateral to present before you can access loans. And even where you have, or you find yourself in a situation where you work within cooperatives, that can also be very limiting because a lot of the cooperatives operate at the level of micro. So if you really are looking at scaling up businesses, that might not be the option for you. And often you find that youth are not able to operate at that level of cooperatives. You find that a lot of the times, women, especially literate women who operate within the rural environment, who operate mostly within the agricultural value chains, are the ones who engage in cooperatives, because cooperatives provide social collateral. And they also you know, work within themselves to cross-guarantee one another, because even the, the banks, the microfinance banks, as well as the Bank of Agric, that tend to work with these groups of people within the local sector, also require some procedures which will still you know, and ensure that there is something to hold on to in case these people are not able to pay those loans. So those are some of the issues that the women as well as male and female youth encounter in the course of trying to develop enterprises. And then another issue that you also discover or identify which has to do also with the patriarchal culture is the fact that for women in particular, the triple gender role that they play also robs them of valuable time that they could invest into their business activities. And for the, for, the, for the young men, as well as the young women, because we operate in a culture that tends to look down on the young people, they see the young people as not being responsible enough to take actions that impact on their future. A lot of the times, young men and young women do not also have access to certain means as well, like the land, for example. Most often you find that even where you know, a father or a mother, as the case may be, you know, leaves, wills a portion of land to their children. You are not able to access that land until you are of a certain age that you are considered old enough.
And so even for young people who want to go into serious business, collateral could also constitute a barrier. And that is also as a result of the, the gender rules or the socialization process. But sometimes you also find that the roles that are assigned to young men and women within our context also can serve as a barrier. For instance, young men are often seen as tools in the hands of politicians during elections as talks to carry out violent activities against their opponents. And that is considered an acceptable role for men, for young men in politics. So you find that just like a Professor Tommy made reference to young men who will aspire to become PAs, those are even the ones that are lucky. Often they, don't, they are not that ambitious to aspire to become PAs. They are very satisfied being talks, carrying the bags of the politicians, and being sent on errands to hurt somebody because that will bring them some money. While the young women themselves are sometimes just satisfied being cool or not during campaigns to the men who are going on campaign trail. So you find that, oh, young women are following the campaign teams. What is getting them so excited? What is their role? What are they going to do? But they are there as mistresses. And that is the role that they are there to play. And they are very satisfied with that role. And oftentimes, that is the way they are able to meet whatever needs that they have. So for us to be able to come up with initiatives that can equitably engage young men and women within the Niger Delta, as well as meet the needs of women to ensure that they benefit equitably as well from processes of development, then we also have to look at those skills that will enable them to engage in enterprises that will also give them the confidence to be able to even explore partnerships, which at present you know, is you know, largely lacking within our culture. The young people are very individualistic. We have very few examples of models of partnerships that have worked. So those are some of the options that stakeholders such as PIND, the organized private sector, even government agencies that are interested in supporting entrepreneurship development for young people within the Niger Delta might want to consider again dealing with the mindset for young people to also see themselves as being in a position to run successful businesses. Seeing businesses within the available value chains as relevant, as good options, as viable options. If you look at some of the figures that I put down in the profile, when you get the PowerPoint, you will see that the Niger Delta, most of the young people, even the women within the Niger Delta, majority of them operate within the informal sector. We live within the rural areas. And so for you to consider viable options for young women, for male and female youth within the Niger Delta, you must consider the agricultural value chain because that is where you know, most of the women are most active right now. And so you don't want to take someone out of a context that he or she is familiar with you know, to a, a completely different context and introduce the person to a completely different skill or opportunity which the person will struggle with. So those are some of the opportunities that currently exist. And there are initiatives, there are interventions currently that are happening within the Niger Delta that tend to provide some of those opportunities, which, you know, even pinned as a facilitating body can also, you know, look at building linkages and synergy with the existing interventions or uh, facilitators of such interventions. The YESO project is one of them. I'm sure, you know, many of us are familiar with the YESO skills, you know, uh, building projects. Uh, component which targets young people within the ages of 18 to 35. And within the Niger Delta, four states out of the 20 states that is being targeted by the World Bank for the YESO project, four within the Niger Delta region, uh, Imo State, Cross River State, Abia State, and, um, and which is the fourth state. I have reflected it in the PowerPoint. So there are four states within the Niger Delta that are targeted by the World Bank for the YESO project. KISO, also under the funding of the Canadian government, is implementing a youth leadership project in Cross River State, which is targeting green jobs. Their focus is on renewable natural resources, also looking at the agricultural value chain within Cross River State. And they are looking at 12,000 youth to be trained, 50% young men, 50% young women. I've also identified a group of people within the categories of women as well as male and female youths who are often neglected 
And thanks to SAIS, I also became conscious of this group of people myself recently when I did some work for SAIS. And this is looking at young men and women who are living with disabilities, as well as women who are living with disabilities. Often nobody remembers them. I don't know how many of them we have in this room right now. They are also, they constitute part of these target groups that we are interested in within the Niger Delta. And often nobody remembers them. Their voices are completely drowned. And so they have no voice, they have no agency. Those are also some of the structural barriers that impede their participation in development processes. Because of course, if we are looking at building peace within the Niger Delta region, and we are trying to make gains of the, the achievement that has been made so far through the amnesty program, then we'll also be looking at some of those vulnerable groups that are not in a position to speak for themselves, who also need to be able to access you know, the means of production, who are also, in, you know, who also need to build sustainable livelihoods. And the emphasis here is also not just about livelihoods, it's also about wealth creation. Because if the target of whichever, initi uh, whichever initiative that is being developed over the next four years, be it by government or development partners, if the focus is just about livelihoods, then at the end of the day, we will keep going around the same cycle. Because the young people or the women who are going to be you know, are targeted through these interventions have to also realize that it doesn't stop with them putting food on their tables. It also has to include them being able to create wealth. And in that process, more young people are able to also buy into the idea, the concept of entrepreneurship development as a viable option rather than waiting for government. And in addition to that, you know, there will also need to be some ways of building synergy with relevant government agencies to ensure that the quality of education is also improved. Because if we also have to continue to provide skills as an alternative to quality education, to skills-based education, then it means that even the children yet on board will still go through the same cycle that the current use of the Niger Delta are going through. So those two interventions have to be addressed simultaneously. One might be approached from a policy angle, while the other is being approached from a skills building angle. But we cannot neglect the fact that the, 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 the quality of education in Niger Delta and in Nigeria as a whole, it has gone down so badly to the extent that it is actually very difficult for it to provide even any form of option whatsoever, any kind of option for Nigerian youth. And we must, as stakeholders who are interested in the Niger Delta, take interest in issues that concern quality of education. What are we going to do about it? In what way can we add our voices to that discussion? What needs to be done? A lot of us who have the opportunity, some, are, some of us are even sweating to send our children out to school because we realize that the educational system in Nigeria is not able to provide the quality of education that we deserve for our children. But we are looking at a region that is overwhelmed by the level of poverty that is occasioned by the depletion of the environment as well as so many other you know, corrupt practices, so many other factors that we, in fact, cannot completely exhaust if we were to enumerate them one after the other. So for us to be able to build a prosperity that is sustainable for the people of the Niger Delta, we also have to be interested in partnering with the government. I know Professor Patitomi has said, let's keep government out of it, but there are some things that government must be involved in. We must engage them in the conversation. Even if somebody is going to provide the skills that is needed to transform these institutions, it is important for that conversation to involve all the relevant stakeholders. We are talking about inclusive development. And inclusive development involves all the relevant partners, all the relevant stakeholders. And those uh, relevant stakeholders include all of us in this room. The civil society organizations, the government development partners, and the government must also be part of that you know, uh, discussion. At the end of the day, we will be able to create sustainable options that the young people of today and the women of tomorrow will continue to take advantage of. Otherwise, the poverty will continue to reproduce itself within the uh, Niger Delta region. So I have actually outlined some of the recommendations that I think are relevant elements to constitute a framework for putting together a program for the youth of the Niger Delta within the next four years, as well as the women of the Niger Delta. And some of these include options like cluster businesses, cluster farming, because where you find uh, situations where women have to grapple with challenges of lack of access and control over land, 
then you have to think of what means provides them with the power to be able to access land as a resource. If they are going to engage in any viable agricultural businesses, then they need to be able to access land one way or the other. So cluster farming, for instance, provides women with the opportunity to access land at no extra, without any impediment, because this is group farming that is done through pooled resources. And often this land is either sourced from government or it is sourced from communities. And there are no threats to the access that is given to the different members of this cluster group. And the same approach can also be extended to other forms of businesses. And that is why even the concept of micro-franchising also comes in. It is not a concept that is very familiar to many people and it needs to be evolved. But it is a concept that has some appeal which can be developed as a model for the youth of the Niger Delta as well as the women within the Niger Delta. Because this option provides the opportunity for people who ordinarily are not able to initiate businesses, to initiate specific skills, to you know, inherit or latch onto a platform that has already been developed by somebody else and with certain basic systems in place that enables the business to run. And so these kinds of businesses that are done, these kinds of uh, options that, are, that provide that micro-level franchising will then enable young men and women within the Niger Delta region to engage in businesses. And that will also help to, to deal with the misconceptions or the fears, the myths associated with businesses or entrepreneurship as an option. So those are some of the models that can be developed. Mentorship is another very crucial one. Because as a, a woman struggling to do business, incidentally, some of us woke up quite late. There are no support systems in place. When you are entering into a business that you do not have any support base, you struggle for a long time. The institutions are not supportive. There are no individuals who have been in that business who can say, okay, let me hold your hand. And so if we are talking about skills building for male and female within the Niger Delta and women, then we must also be thinking of mentoring you know, options as well to be able to ensure that there is somebody who has some level of experience in that area that those people are going into to provide the support that they need, to provide the information. Sometimes running businesses in Nigeria, from my experience, I've just started running a travel agency. You find that even information is difficult to come by. Those who have been in the business are holding information. They call it trade secrets. So you try to access information you know, about basic things requiring, you know, uh, uh, pertaining to the business that you're into. You ask somebody questions and the person is not forthcoming with the, with the questions. You might get some very generic information from the internet, but it's not contextual. And so it doesn't provide you the kind of leverage that you will have if you were to get that kind of information from someone who has worked at that business within the context that you're operating in. And so those are the likely challenges that young people, male and female, young uh, uh, women as well within the Niger Delta, and especially more so for those with disabilities. Those are the kinds of challenges that they are likely to face, where information is lacking for the kinds of businesses they are getting into. It is not enough to provide training. We also need to be able to provide, you know, accompaniment support, because sometimes, you know, somebody runs into a particular challenge in carrying out or trying out a particular idea, especially in this age of innovation. You want people to become innovative. You want people to be creative. And creativity does not mean ranzeroxing some, what somebody else has done over the past five years or 10 years. You want somebody to be original. And one way to be original is trying new ideas. And the only way you can succeed with trying new ideas is to also be able to you know, share information with other people who are as, as radical in, your, in their thinking as well as creative. Other people who see innovation as an opportunity. And so those are some of the options that I have put forward for the panel discussions that we are going to have later on, which I hope will help to expand the space for young men and women within the Niger Delta and for women to be able to surmount some of the barriers that they currently face. And granting certainly provides a good option. The UWIN initiative that was introduced by the government of Good Luck Jonathan at least helped to promote innovation. Of all the government initiatives that have been introduced in the area of entrepreneurship, that is one initiative that one can look around and see that it has yielded some results. 
you know, some young people have been able to start businesses and those businesses are running because somebody, you know, you know meant, uh, somebody provided accompaniment support from the point where they got the first tranche of the grant to the point where they were able to achieve certain milestones. So that kind of support system needs to be put in place. That is one model that can be adapted. We might not want to, you know, recommend options that will lead to dependency, as has been highlighted, but it's also important for us to recognize the fact that the particular group of people that we are talking about here are people who are, who are faced with you know, so many different you know, barriers from different angles. Because even for those of them who might be able to assess the loans, it is also very important to approach this initiative from a gender mainstreaming point of view. Because there are women who have been given even loans by some development, through some development interventions in the past, and they are not able to effectively engage or you know, contribute and invest in those businesses to the extent that they are able to make the profits and repay those loans. Because the, their husbands were not carried along, they were not sensitized about these businesses, and some of them who are still victims of violence or victims of abuses within their marital homes you know, were deprived of these monies or this capital that was meant for businesses. So even where whatever options that are being provided for women or male and female youth within the Niger Delta is being discussed, a gender mainstreaming perspective must be used, must be utilized to ensure that all the relevant stakeholders understand that these options are meant to create wealth and that a lot more people, the, the immediate families, the entire community and the entire region stands to benefit from that wealth creation. And so that is the only way we can build sustainable options. I can see that... Um, Somebody is standing by my side. I'm sorry I didn't uh, run through the, the PowerPoint the way I intended it, but I am I'm sure that by the time we go into the panel discussions, we'll be able to explore some of the points that may not have been raised. The bottom line is skills development and entrepreneurship development is the way to go to provide viable options for male and female youth within the Niger Delta and the women of the Niger Delta. But that must be, that must be done you know, in, within the context of providing a very strong support base that also takes into consideration the different resources that will enhance that option. Thank you very much.